There are as many microbes in our gut as there are cells in our human body. We are less human than microbial. Fellow Homo sapiens, well this week in part one of two, we speak with research specialist Stefania Prasnielsen from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm in Sweden about her epilepsy research into gut microbiota explaining to us what they are, what, how they connect with the brain, and the link between them, our poo or feces, and our seizures. In part two, which is next week, we will hear about Stephanie's clinical study involving poo or fecal samples from a group of children with refractory epilepsy who started the ketogenic diet and investigating their gut microbiota and how it might be related to changes in epileptic seizures. Stephanie also talks about future international collaborations in collections of stool samples for furthering epilepsy research. Thank you, Tori, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Stephanie Prast-Nielsen and I'm a research specialist at the Center for Translational Microbiome Research at the Karolinska Institute here in Stockholm, Sweden. I do research focused on the gut microbiota and its interaction with the host, in my case, the human being. What does that actually mean to us more sort of lay people and what is a gut microbiota? Well, the microbiota in general is all the trillions of microbes that live inside of our body or on our surface that can be in the gut, in the skin, in the vagina, anywhere we have contact to the environment. And this is mainly bacteria but also fungi and viruses, and most of them, they're not causing any disease. They're rather important for our health. They, we have to remember they evolved with us through thousands, millions of years, and they live in a really close relationship with us. They protect us from harmful bacteria or other microbes. They train our immune system to tell from good, the good bugs from the bad bugs, and they can produce important molecules for health, such as vitamins, metabolites, and even neurotransmitters. And the gut microbiota <coughs> is the largest microbiota in our um, human body, and it's the one that is best studied. And it's so large, actually, that there are as many microbes in our gut as there are cells in our human body. So we're less than, we're actually combining all the microbiotas on our body, we are less human than microbial. That's pretty impressive. It, it, like from an evolutionary perspective, it's like, it's almost like it's taken over our, us as the whole organism. It's like, I'm in charge, right? Because there are so many different cells, or oh, so many cells of that compared to everything else. Yes, and actually it's even more exciting if you think about that these microbes, they're like different species. Um, and we can have up to a thousand different species and they have different genes and different genomes and it has been estimated that our microbiota actually contains about three million genes while our human genome only contains 23,000 genes. Oh my god. <laughs> so on a, on a gene level we have 150 microbial genes per one human gene. Wow. That's mind blowing, isn't it? it? It is, and it makes me feel pretty pathetic as well. <laughs> like, one should praise uh, these microbiota of the gut. So, I think loads of people, you know, sometimes even people who don't, you know, do not specialize in the way that you do, they'll be like, they'll just think, quite frankly, of feces or, or poo when it comes to the gut. What are the benefits it brings to our lives, and why do we need so many different um, versions or species of this? Well, as I mentioned before, they are like, for example, they train our immune system, but they also, since having so many different genes, they can produce lots of different metabolites and signaling molecules. And we, we know quite a lot, but we are still scratching the surface. There is still so much more we need to learn to really understand those relationships. Um, but for example, an important relationship is that the gut microbes, they degrade our, um, the fibers that we eat into something called short-chain fatty acids and they are taken up by the body and they reach all different organs including the brain where they have health promoting effect like anti-inflammatory effects, anti-cancer effects and they even can regulate gene expression even, even in the brain. Amazing! And I suppose uh, then how that happens or how well it happens depends upon quality of diet as well, right? Or what is quality of diet for the individual? 
Very much. Um, the composition of the gut microbiota depends on many different environmental factors, but one of the largest factors is actually diet, because what we eat is what we feed them. Um, but also, for example, um, medication has an impact on the composition of the gut microbiota. And if you disturb this healthy composition, this can lead to different diseases, not only in the gut where you can get inflammatory bowel disease or colorectal cancer, but since the uh, gut microbiota can make all those molecules that travel to all the different organs, if they make the wrong molecules or if they're lacking, if the microbiota is not producing those molecules that we need, then you can also get diseases in other organs. Tell us about your study into, well, the link between the microbiome seizures and epilepsy. In order to follow that, I think um, we need, first need to think about um, that the, so the gut microbes, they can communicate with the brain, as I said. And this can be done in different ways by those molecules or there's a communication uh, across the so-called microbiota gut brain axis. <laughs> there's a real term for that. Um, and that includes the metabolites, that includes um, hormones, that includes the vagus nerve. Gut microbes can stimulate the vagus nerve, which is the longest nerve in our body that directly connects our intestines to the brain. Um, and that also includes the immune system as they can um, regulate infl systemic inflammation through different cytokines and other inflammatory molecules. And there have been some studies that compared the composition of the gut microbiota between healthy uh, individuals and people with epilepsy. And they have shown differences in their gut microbiota, especially in patients that have drug-resistant epilepsy. However, those are usually just um, simple comparative so-called cross-sectional studies that don't show any causal relationship. They just show the composition in the, those two groups is different, but it doesn't say that the epilepsy is the reason for that. It could be the medication that the epilepsy patients take that have an impact on the gut microbiota or that those patients happen to, in general, have a different diet than the other group you're comparing to. But in animal models, you have <clears throat> the possibility to study this um, much better um, through longitudinal studies, for example. And there were two really important findings I'd like to mention um, in rat epilepsy models. They could show that the composition of the gut microbiota before traumatic brain injury had an impact on whether those rats then developed epilepsy. That is a study that just came out this year. Uh, and the same group also could show that um, when they had two groups of rats where they induced seizures in one group by chronically stressing those and then kindling to provoke seizures, when they took fecal samples from those rats into rats that were not stressed and not seizure prone, they also became more seizure prone just by getting the microbes through the feces transplanted and vice versa, that those rats that were sensitive for seizures became less sensitive for se to seizures when they got the fecal transplants from the non-stressed rats that didn't have seizures. And that's kind of fascinating, I think. It is pretty fascinating. Um, you know, people always think of uh, fecal matter, or for people who aren't familiar with the term, poo, <laughs> in a bit of a gross way, but it's a key part of us as organisms and can, as you're saying, affect the brain and therefore have impacts on epilepsy um, or seizures alone. So as I mentioned that the diet has an impact on the composition of the gut microbiota. Um, mm. In the study that we performed, um, we uh, followed patients, children with drug-resistant epilepsies that started the ketogenic diet. And that is an alternative treatment for those who listen and don't know um, for epilepsy. If you don't get much better from anti-seizure medication, you can start this diet, which means cutting out almost all your carbohydrates. And uh, about 80% of your calories come from fat. And the remaining is um, proteins and some carbs. And it requires such willpower, like there are literally some vegetables you can't eat, right? Because they have too much carbs in them. Yeah, and especially fruits, they have yeah, even yeah. more 
carbs. It, it's tough. It's a lot of avocado and oils and butter and bacon. And it's not the Atkins diet. It's way more than that. And it doesn't work for everyone. Just so you know, it's not an yeah, instant thing, you know, but it is sometimes an option. And as, yes, I mean, those that are drug resistant and try the diet, about half of them get much better. Um, so it's definitely worth trying, but it needs to be done under supervision of a diet, specially trained dietitian mm -hmm. for the ketogenic diet. This is not something you should do at home and you should consult your uh, neurologist first. But it has a very good effect for about half of the patients and for the other half it doesn't. And it's really so far not very well known why some respond to the diet and others don't. And we think that maybe there may, uh, may be parts in the gut microbiota that can have an answer to that. Uh, so we studied the changes of the gut microbiota um, during three months of this diet. And as one would expect, we could see that um, bacteria that are highly dependent on carbohydrates, they were decreasing during this diet because we didn't feed them the carbohydrates they usually get. And that included uh, bifidobacteria. Um, and uh, we could see... This was like true for all the patients, all the bifidobacteria they had, they decreased during the three months of treatment. But when we separated the responders and the non-responders and checked, looked at their differences, we could see that those that responded to the diet, they had more so-called infant type bifidobacteria in their gut before starting the diet uh, compared to the non-responders. And typically, they are called infant-type bifidobacteria because they're like early colonizers of your gut. Mm -hmm. In the first one or two years of life, they are quite abundant, and then they decrease and get replaced by other bifidobacteria. Uh, but for some reason, our responders, they had still had quite high bifidobacteria, these infant-type bifidobacteria in their gut, although they were um, several years older. Um, and this, these bifidobacteria correlated with um, tumor necrosis factor, TNF, in the blood, which mm -hmm. is an inflammatory molecule that has been shown to be increased in several forms of epilepsies. And when they started the diet, those infant-type bifidobacteria decreased, and also the TNF in the blood decreased. Um, and we think that may may be part of um, the response they had to anti-seizures. Thanks so much to Stephanie for providing us with insight into the significance of diet, gut microbiota and poo when it comes to health, especially when we are talking about the epilepsies. Do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and make sure that you don't miss next week's episode where Stephanie tells us about her clinical study into the impact of the ketogenic diet upon a group of children with refractory epilepsy and future international collection of stool samples for furthering this really cool epilepsy research. If you enjoyed the episode, then please do share it with your friends, family and colleagues because it really helps us to get our messages about the epilepsies out there to the masses. Mm -hmm.